Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Case Studies with the BizDoc. This week, it's Full Tilt Poker, and we're going to talk about what went wrong, a little bit of the history, some lessons that you can learn, whether you're running a t-shirt company or one of the world's largest online poker sites. We'll start with the history. We go back, 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 13 years to 2003. Yeah, a couple years prior to that, there was a wonderful movie. It was out called Rounders, and you may remember the Matt Damon, a tremendous, tremendous movie, and it gained uh, popularity for poker, which was already coming up in popularity, and then, enabled by the internet, we had this online poker boom from 03 to 06, where it was actually the online poker player uh, audience was doubling every year, which is really tremendous. And Full Tilt was born in the middle of that. It actually came out of an Irish company, and the Irish company made software that made the online poker experience possible, and that uh, company led to the creation of Full Tilt. There was also some professional poker players involved and a founder. Uh, Ray Bittar was involved, Chris Ferguson, big poker star, uh, Howard Letter, another big poker star, all came together to create Full Tilt Poker. And away it went. And with all things on the internet is regulation usually follows close behind, especially if you're dealing with banking, finance, or online gambling. And this was online gambling. Uh, people were putting money in, they would win, they would lose, they had an account that was there, and U.S. steps in, this big boom is happening. U.S. Congress steps in with the Unlawful Online Gaming Act that says, listen, online gaming is not necessarily illegal, but there are legal and illegal ways to do it, and so they clarified it, put a law in front of it. Well, basically, as the history goes, over the next three years, you know, Full Tilt continued to grow, and Full Tilt and uh, Poker Stars were the two biggest sites. There's a lot of little ones coming up, some super high-end ones that only had, you know, a few thousand players, but the big, big mass of the market was Full Tilt and Poker Stars. And by 2009, Full Tilt had 28 thousand players. Now, regardless of whether what was going on was legal or illegal, there's something in here I thought was a great lesson and it caught my eye when I was doing research back into the history of Full Tilt. In 2010, they created something called Rush Poker, which meant every time a table broke, like everybody else at the table, um, you know, cashed in, had no more money or chips for that day, they would instantly and quickly move you to a spot at another table. Rush poker. So you could keep playing and your stake would come over and boom, you're right back in the game with somebody else. You don't have to wait. Um, unlike the early days, uh, think about like chat rooms on AOL or going back in the dawn of chat. If, if there was no one in a chat room talking about fantasy football or something you wanted to talk about, it was kind of a bummer and you had to go hunt around for a new chat room. Well, that led to delays, and it was a delay in one person going from here to here, which meant a delay in which they would be seeing the ads on things like chat rooms, stuff like that. Well, Full Tilt saw that as a delay in that person gambling more money. So the creation of Rush Poker comes out, which I think was a great product innovation. Again, regardless of what's about to happen in 2011, I think it was showing that there was a great innovative product team that was at the back there, Full Tilt Poker, making all this happen and making a game that you and I could go on and enjoy poker and remove what's called latency or downtime. This table breaks, boom, we're at a new table with people we don't know, but we're playing again. Well, that would be the peak of it. And in 2011, some things were starting to show up. There were rumors abounding that people had trouble getting their money out of Full Tilt, especially people that had significant money. Uh, and there was also some rumors abounding that maybe some banks that were in on it, uh, foreign banks, had actually been bribed. All of this rumors would come down on Black Friday, April 15th, 2011, as the U.S. government came down like a hammer and shut down five different domains, including Full Tilt and Poker Stars, which were probably 50% of the player market. They were probably 70% of the dollar gambled market, at least according to Forbes magazine, who had back a year prior in 2010, had said that the market was about $1.4 billion of online poker playing. That's not casinos, that's just online. And that's just US, which is huge. Well. 50% of the players, 70% of market, everybody shut down. The day after, 
ESPN, which had been broadcasting some things, they went on full blackout. They took down all the ads. They took out all the house promotions they were doing for new shows. They canceled new shows. So if you don't think that the federal government was also knocking on ESPN's door saying, hey, you're supporting something that we're about to put the hammer down on, then you're not paying attention. And that's exactly what happened. The whole place comes to a roaring halt. The most damning figure that was in all of this federal indictment and everything that came down, the U.S. government was claiming that they owed $390 million to the players, but they only had assets of around $60 million. Oh my gosh. And so they were claiming this is a bit of a Ponzi scheme. And a Ponzi scheme is where you keep bringing people in who pay some money, and then these people at the top of a pyramid get that money, and so they think they got into a game and they're getting paid. Whereas realities, these people are only paid because the bottom of the pyramid gets bigger and bigger. And at some point in time, it stops growing, and then nobody gets paid. The whole thing falls over, and it's exposed as a fraud. That's a Ponzi scheme, if you haven't heard that term. So they say, this is a Ponzi scheme. All the new players coming in with a couple hundred bucks to start their account, we're actually helping to, to, to liquidate some of the accounts that were up here because they were claiming that money had been moved out of the accounts. That Batar, Ferguson, and Letterer, regardless of you know, what you felt about gaming or online poker in general, U.S. government was saying, you're doing this the wrong way. You've been siphoning money off. We believe you've been for, uh, laundering it through foreign banks. We believe foreign banks have actually had executives bribed to assist with this. So it's kind of like if you ever saw the movie Scarface, you know, and, and uh, he goes into the bank in Florida with great army duffel bags full of money, and he's telling them, look, I'll give you 15% of this money. Just run it through this way, run it through that way. And that was a bribe. Well, they claim that Full Tilt Poker was doing something very, very similar um, back in 2009 to 2011, is that money was bribing banks and they were laundering it, and the founders were pulling it out, and they did not have the cash in the bank to come back. So it's a tale of two cities. If, you know, this came down pretty heavy. In the end, Ray Batar surrendered, I think it was $40 million in assets, and the investigation turned up that Chris Ferguson actually received uh, $25 million to himself uh, that came out of it as like ownership fees or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that if it was real profit, but if it was coming out of the bucket that had money for all the players, then that's dead wrong, and that's what the government felt. Well, all this madness happens, and a year later, Poker Stars, it was number two, and was allegedly kind of playing by the rules, at least close to the rules, uh, they acquired Full Tilt Poker for right around half a billion dollars. And they, two years later, had worked a plan for these players that had been waiting three years, started receiving their money. And that was part of the agreement for purchase, and I, I believe it was in conjunction with um, U.S. government cooperation that said players would start getting their money in 15. And so here you have, it's coming back on a global basis. There's still a lockdown in the United States, but people are getting their money. And then comes what we call a white knight. A white knight is a company or investor that shows up and kind of saves the day. And they usually have a contact, um, a, 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 an idea to add to the business, or they are another rival business that's gonna take it in. And as a result, they save the day. Well, that would be Amaya Gaming. Amaya Gaming bought Poker Stars, which now owns Full Tilt, both of them, for $5 billion. So here you have, you know, 11 years after it all starts, Amaya Gaming comes in and buys this stuff for $5 billion. Because in the background on a global scale, this online poker was still growing. Remember that 1.4 billion? Now the market was so big, Amaya thinks it's worth $5 billion. There is only one word for that, and that is damn! That's a lot of money for a market on, in terms of online poker playing. Well, and the next thing that happened, the state of New Jersey gave Amaya a license for Poker Stars and Full Tilt. And Full Tilt's now just a brand under Poker Stars because Poker Stars owns the whole thing and they were relaunched on March 21st, 2016, that US players once again could play poker online against each other and do it under the umbrella of a company which we believe is doing everything fair. So I think there's two morals to the story. The first is 
you know, founder greed is, is not unique to online poker. Founder greed is not, you know, unique to, you know, a, a, a software startup. Founder greed happens in Kickstarter companies that take money and never really build anything. It's out there and it's horrifying and when you see it, it just makes you sick. But what was also going on here is Full Tilt had jumped into a market and built software to enable something new and the software that they did such as Rush Poker proved to be that there were sharp product people in there. So it was on the good side, it was a bunch of sharp product people building a really entertaining thing that thousands and thousands of people around the world want to participate in. But then on the dark side, whatever happened here, whatever was going on, greed and siphoning it off caused the cops to show up on Black Friday and put it together. Well, we're staying with the gambling theme, and next week what we are going to do live from Las Vegas is we are going to dive into DraftKings and FanDuel. And until then, I need the pillow. Boom. See, I was making a bet that he would actually throw it to me, and guess what? I won the bet. Please subscribe to Valuetainment, the best channel on the internet for interesting content, educational content about entrepreneurship. Until next time, I'm Tom Ellsworth, and I hope I let you better than I found you.